My name is Miles Conley, for those that don't know me, and I'm a, frightening to think about it, nearly 30-year veteran of the giant screen industry and uh, have a bunch of film credits to my name, and I'm, I'm really happy to be up here and, and proud to host this panel. Uh, and I have the, the privilege and honor to have been involved in the films that each of these filmmakers have made. So I've seen a lot of the stories that you're, you're going to hear today uh, play out firsthand, and uh, none of these people would be up here if they weren't successful and if their films weren't outstanding. Uh, there are other first-timers that aren't on this panel, and you'll find them around, usually at the bar, and you're free to ask them all the <laughs> questions that you ask us today. Um, my hope is to, to draw on the experiences that these people have had and get some interesting insights from them uh, that will influence you if you're planning to make your first giant screen film or if you're a seasoned veteran, and I know there are people out here in the audience that have even more experience than I do, but every film is unique and every film is a learning uh, opportunity. So uh, let me just introduce the panel members. On my right, we have Andrew Young and Susan Todd uh, from Backyard Wilderness. They're the producers, writers, directors. Uh, on my left, I've got Michael, far left is Michael Dalton Smith. Uh, maybe easier to say what he didn't do on Volcanoes, but he was producer, writer, director, DOP, blah, blah, blah. He'll tell you all about it. <laughs> and then Peter Chang, uh, producer, director, DOP on uh, Cuba. So I'm going to do most of my talking over the next two to three minutes, and then I'm going to kick it off to these guys. But uh, I think with my experience and perspective, I can set it up a little bit for people that maybe don't have a ton of experience. And let me just say that this is labeled as the first timers panel, but none of these people are first timers when it comes to filmmaking. They all have quite illustrious careers and backgrounds in television and commercials and still photography and things like that. So none of them just came out of film school and started making giant screen films. And if anybody is trying to do that, you should definitely come talk to me after the panel. Um, <laughs> The giant screen is unique and it's amazing and each of us is uh, attracted to it for some of the same reasons, but in each case probably for different reasons as well. But I think what we share and have in common is this love for the, the, the giant image, the scale and scope of it, the experience that comes with that image when it's done right. Uh, we love the documentary nature of the films that we make and the um, what I would call sort of enlightening uh, capability that these films bring to audiences. And then there's the really nice longevity. You know, when we do make a film that's successful and popular, that film will go on to play for years and years around the world and influence audiences, both young and old. And so that's, you know, those are things that, that give us a bit more satisfaction than if we were just knocking out golf infomercials or, uh, you know, things like that. Um, but there are enormous challenges in this format, uh, some unlike any other format. And oftentimes those challenges only become apparent after you're, after you're well embarked on a project. Uh, for me, uh, I find that the giant screen is probably the hardest uh, format I've ever worked in, uh, with virtual reality being a very close second. But it is just unforgiving. And, it's always daunting when we see people presenting films in, in development and things like that. And, and you can just tell, like, they really don't have a sense of what they're, they're getting into. Uh, so getting it right in this format is, is, if you can get it right here, you can get it right anywhere else. Um, for these films to be successful, you have to face all kinds of challenges, right? It's not just about technical, like who's got the highest resolution camera or the biggest budget or the longest schedule. Uh, Technical quality is certainly a big part of it, and it's not to be taken lightly, but um, there is uh, things like the age range. You'll hear people toss out, you know, these films have to work from 8 to 80. So think about that, 8 to 80. That's not just a generational gap. That's a, how do people perceive information? How sensitive are they to stimulation? What's a cutting pace going to be like? What is a 14-year-old kid who's used to PlayStation expecting versus his 70-year-old grandfather. All of these things have to be taken into account, and they all have to be dealt with in a way that works for, for that age range. And then last but not least is what I call the three audience theory. And, and this is, again, kind of unique to this market in that we have to make films that appeal to three very different audiences. The first one is the, the audience that's made up of the film financiers. They're looking at it from a very unique perspective 
And if they don't like it, that's the end of the game. Like there's just, if you can't find the money, you're not making a film. The second one is all of our friends at the theaters, the film bookers and things like that. They have their own unique set of criteria and you need to satisfy, you need to tick those boxes and make sure that those people are happy. And then last but not least, of course, is the audience, the people that are coming to the, the institution and, and coming to see the film, in some cases pay to buy tickets to see the film. Uh, they have to be happy too, because if they leave that theater unhappy, certainly they're gonna talk about it and other people won't come. And uh, ultimately in time, you know, that film will not succeed and sometimes those theaters won't succeed if they <laughs> run enough bad films back to back. So it's in our best interest, of course, to satisfy all three of those audiences and sitting here, it doesn't sound all that daunting, but I can tell you that it's a, it's a unique and, and uh, interesting challenge, shall we say. So I've got a list of questions here. We're gonna run through stuff today. This is uh, in large part kind of a how to do it or how not to do it. I don't know, you guys can tell me, but uh, opportunity for people. And we will do a Q&A at the end of the session, but I'm just gonna open it up and, and you're gonna hear some more stories and some perspectives that undoubtedly will be different from each of the filmmakers. and. Uh, yeah, I hope we'll all take it to heart. So I think we'll start with you, Andy, down at the end uh, with question number one, and Susan, free to weigh in any time, but what did you find to be uh, the hardest part once you embarked on Backyard Wilderness? Was it just the creative angles that the giant screen required? Was it finding financing? Was it adapting to the technical requirements of the giant screen? Like, what was the most difficult thing? Where to begin? <laughs> um, <clears throat> there were lots of huge challenges. Um, you know, figuring out how to do what we actually wanted to do. We had these crazy ideas with this film and not a solid idea at the beginning as to how we were going to pull it off. But, um, and I will focus on one particular thing just for the sake of getting through this, which was um, learning which rules were okay to break and which rules were really not okay to break. Um, and I'll add to that by saying, learning that the sacred master really is sacred. <laughs> uh, and you can't really change that. And no matter how many times I looked at it and uh, were framing things, thinking about it, I didn't really grasp it until I saw the sacred master projected in a dome theater uh, at one of the GSCA presentations. And we were already you know, well into the production of our film, and all of a sudden, I saw the sacred master the way the audience would actually see it for the very first time, and I was just like, oh my God. So let me just jump in. For those that aren't familiar with the sacred master, it's a, it's a field chart or a giant grid that represents the IMAX screen. It was produced by Chris Reyna and the team at Imagica 25 years ago, but it is, it's called the sacred master for a reason. And yeah, as Andy says. So I'll just cap it off with a quick sacred master horror story <laughs> <laughs> to keep it interesting, um, which was when we began production of Backyard Wilderness, we actually did not know that we were gonna be a giant screen film. We were toying with the idea maybe of just a regular theatrical release. We had this concept, but we really hadn't figured out what was the best vehicle for the film. And we had, however, we had jumped into filming things. And you know, it may not seem like filming a, a salamander laying eggs would be one of the more difficult things that's been done on the giant screen. Certainly it's not. But uh, having said that, it's not a piece of cake either. Uh, there are about three days out of the whole year when a salamander uh, may actually lay eggs. And you have no idea which three, okay, within a week or two you know when it's gonna be, but you really don't know which of, uh, day it's going to happen on. Uh, you have to obviously have a uh, pregnant female with eggs, you know, in front of your camera when it happens, and it's going to happen sometime in the middle of the night. So suffice it to say that it is an exercise in sleep deprivation. <laughs> and you can imagine the excitement of actually filming it beautifully right in front of you after a huge amount of sleep deprivation. And then imagine the sinking feeling when you share the footage with your trusted advisor, one of the smartest things that we did was have a, a trusted advisor, our esteemed moderator, uh, reviewing things like this once we had decided that we were in fact going to be a giant screen film. And uh, that sequence, which would have been beautiful in any other format, did not pass the Miles test. It was like, uh -uh, it's not gonna work in a dome theater. And he was completely right. 
So I would say the hardest thing was accepting that, having to wait a whole year and a whole other week of sleep deprivation to capture that scene again. But I, I just have to say kudos to these guys because a lot of filmmakers would have just said we can't do it again or we'll find another way. But uh, Andy and Susan understood the challenges and, and went right after it. I don't think that was the only thing that you reshot, right? There were a couple of other there things. There were a couple of other things, but yeah. that was the most painful. But, you know, the film is hugely successful and, and in large part because of that dedication. So, yeah, thank you. How about you guys? How about you, Peter? What was the, the most challenging part once you jumped into giant screen? Well, I think initially uh, just figuring out the story and the approach and angle on Cuba, um, having, you know, traveled around there for uh, a month at the very beginning, just, you know, how are we going to tell the story about this country and its people and capture uh, its beauty and spirit? Um, and so <clears throat> we had to look at many different people from different walks of life, uh, many different parts of Cuba, and uh, come up with, you know, a general blueprint on how we would approach this. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the initial drafts of the script were really challenging, and then, um, but then once we had it, uh, getting on the ground in Cuba and, and, and making it happen was, uh, was extremely tough. Um, it was much easier when I was just a tourist traveling around with a DSLR. <laughs> as soon as we had to bring in a production um, and, and smack into the wall of uh, communist bureaucracy, then it was a, a kind of a Kafka-esque nightmare at times, not knowing when and where we would be able to shoot and um, when we would get visas and permits and uh, oftentimes um, uh, like for the ballet competition, for example, even the organizers didn't know when stuff was happening. And so we were just kind of, you know, we had to be ready at any moment, and which is tough when you're shooting with something like the Alexa 65. We would, you know, at times just miss entire takes of, our, of the ballerinas we were following because, you know, no one knew when they were going to go on. Um, and Cuba was unique in that um, it's an amazing country, an amazing culture, but it's also amazing politically, both internally and externally. So I think when you guys were kicking things off, we were sort of in a political climate where everything was opening up and Cuba was going to be great and we're all going to be going there on holiday. And within just a few months of that, it suddenly did a 180, right? And we were reimposing embargoes and right. Cuba was the devil and, you know, Peter was magically navigating his way through all that, or maybe not so magically. Yeah, uh, that's that. That was definitely one of the biggest challenges. Was was uh, the the new presidents that we received on both sides, and um, you know that that really affected you know our ability to get financing and and sponsors and visas and also <coughs> permits, and we would never know, you know, exactly why uh, we had to wait or something was denied, but you know, we could guess that politics had something to do with it. And then we also had natural disasters, you know, hurricanes and um, man-made uh, disasters as well, like the Rolling Stones concert and the Pope. Fast and the Furious 8 and two Pope visits. And so <laughs> that's was, crazy. Fidel so Castro dying. I think that's a, that's a good a good point to make is just because you love a subject doesn't necessarily mean it's the right subject for a giant screen film. I mean, you guys did it right. You filmed in your backyard, literally. So you didn't have to deal with any of that stuff. But still, it wasn't easy. How about you, Michael? What was it like to uh, be there right when the volcano was erupting? Like, How did you know? Did you just keep flying the drone over the volcano for a year until it happened? Or? Yeah, no, it's um, certainly experience comes into play there. And I think I've been doing volcanoes now for about five to ten years. And so you, you become connected with the industry or with what's going on out there. You can sort of anticipate when something's going to erupt. This little fork. Or uh, what could 
could potentially be uh, a possible subject. Uh, a lot of the times with volcanoes, um, you have kind of a set story idea that you would like and things you would like to include in the story, but whether or not that volcano is actually going to cooperate with you. Uh, most often it doesn't, so you're picking ones that you know that are going to be very active. Uh, perhaps uh, they start popping up in the news ahead of time and you keep your eye on it. Um, I don't really like the word volcano chasing because I don't chase volcanoes, so um, I think that's more for the thrill of it and I'm extremely terrified on volcanoes and just really like the beauty of it. Um, so I always put the camera in front. I think turn it, or sorry, the volcano chasers always have the camera on themselves, and that's not what I'm about. So we often will plan like a week or two up on a volcano. Uh, it's interesting hearing his challenges because I grew up in a background where everything that I've ever filmed has been a challenge, be it in Africa, a lot of third world countries. Uh, extreme environments like volcanoes where you have to hike potentially for two to three days to get up to the active crater. There's no support up there. You don't have people bringing you water necessarily or whatever, so you, you got to organize it. And So I'd come from a background where that was very much the norm in everything I did. And so I was well prepared for that side of the thing. But when you do the flip on it, um, one thing that you don't expect with the GSCA world uh, is you have a lot of demands here. And so I actually found the most difficult stage is because you have to provide all these uh, cuts, trailers, rough cuts, and all these things that all of you need, or all the various aspects of the giant screen need. And for somebody who's only had um, uh, experience doing a lot of production where you just basically push ahead in these extreme environments and you just get through it and then now all of a sudden you're doing all the stuff that accom accompanies it. It's, it's a huge change. That's a really good point. <clears throat> this industry is unique in that the bond between the filmmakers and the market, the theaters and the distributors is super tight and we all rely on one another to try and craft films that will be successful and it's unlike that in almost every other industry format, whether it's feature films at studios where they might do a few test screenings and then make all the decisions internally, or indie films, art films where personally people don't care, like they have a vision and they're just going to make their film and it'll sink or swim on its merit. So it's, it's both a blessing and a curse here, as Michael says, because you have to build in time for that review process, you usually have to build an additional budget for that review process, but the, the net result of it is typically not always, but typically a better film and a more successful film. How about you, Susan? How, how was it from your side? What was the, well, were there any easy things from actually, your Actually, I think we, we, there's sort of a misconception that uh, filming in your backyard is easy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's uh, the hardest part for us, you I think. Filming in your underwear? <laughs> or in your pajamas. Um, I think one of the hardest parts was um, just trying to work all the time on the set while you have a family that is living their school lives and everything. So that, that, that was, it was, I mean, we actually had our crew living with us in our, a building about 100 feet away from our house. So it was, it was a, con we were constantly looking for uh, scenes to unfold and were very, very dependent on weather too. Uh, I mean, I had, I had about four different apps on my phone of different weather uh, predictions from the Hudson Valley weather, from the Almanac, from, you know, like the big weather stations, forget it. But because we needed to predict when things were, were go going to take place so that we could do these scenes. And it was, uh, it was, it was very, very challenging because also we had these ideas of what we wanted to uh, film scenes about. Like, uh, we wanted to film a deer walking in front of our house. Well, forget it. You never have the deer walk in front of your house at the right time. So uh, the storytelling aspect of creating our film uh, just, just took a lot of challenge and a lot of strategy to figure out how to do it. And it was... Uh, there was a lot of very, very cold nights sitting in blinds waiting for the sun to rise at just the right place. And then, oh, it's not the right place. It needs to be two degrees over this way. 
So the specificity of the, the, of the kind of shots that we were trying to go for for the giant screen, uh, that was a different, different thing for us. I mean, we filmed uh, nature in Madagascar and uh, Alaska and spent you know, months in the field trying to tell stories of uh, ecosystems there, but to actually do it in our own backyard was, was very hard, and to get those shots as detailed as they needed to be for a giant screen was a totally new thing. And it was always amazing to come to the, uh, the, the, the different conventions and see it on the big screen. I think that was actually one of the happiest moments of our lives was you know, actually seeing it on the screen and saying, oh my God, it looks so good. Okay, kick it over to Andy because yeah, well, he, he wants just, to add. Well, one thing that has to be mentioned when talking about the greatest challenges, and I'm sure all of you guys can resonate with this one, um, is trying to make a film that's not fully funded, yeah. um, which was enormous challenge. Uh, you know, are we really going to finish it? Is it going to get done? How are we going to make do with the resources that we have? You know, it's probably something that you really shouldn't do, but of course we're Everybody driven to does do it, it, and we did. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, what about surprises? Like, uh, Peter, were there any surprise moments either in, in looking at, at edits or on location, things where you're just like, oh, man, I wasn't expecting this? Do you have any good or bad stories? Yeah, I mean, I think Cuba was a constant surprise. Um, often we wouldn't have the permits for what we were intending to shoot on the day we were intending to shoot them. So we had to just find things, other things to shoot, and we would just go out and discover stuff. So a lot of the, uh, many aspects of the film, I think, were discovered that way. Characters, um, you know, little vignettes and stories that could feed into the main ones. Um, in fact, we ended up with probably too many and had, yeah. to, and had to cut. Uh, There's a whole other Cuba film on a shelf somewhere. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I think um, uh, we shot so much that there was, there were many surprises that we discovered throughout. Um, you know, I think with the, with the characters, for example, um, with, with the ballerina, uh, we had to follow several ballerinas, so uh, it was nerve-wracking and also surprising to, to find out who was going to be our lead character. Um, it started to take shape throughout, throughout that process, but, you know. Because she wasn't, she wasn't the obvious winner. She wasn't the obvious, the and she wasn't our top choice at the outset, but and we, had, we started with four um, girls that we cast, and then um, follow them, you know, through the their training and to through the competition. Uh, so, Michael, what about you? Any any surprises along the way related to giant screen or, or your filming experience? I would certainly say probably the technical aspects of it. Um, the giant screen's unforgiving for your image, and uh, as, uh, I think Andy had mentioned when you come out here. Uh, from a different background, you're used to framing things in a certain way, you're used to working in a certain way, and when you walk into that room for the first time, you look up at that huge screen and it's like, are my ideas interesting enough to fill that thing up? And it's pretty daunting, so when you see your, your footage for the first time, it's like a wake-up call, because some things work really well and you see disasters and other things, and so you have to go back and rethink the way you shoot. I think I probably... Uh, ditched about a third of the stuff that I already had at that stage and went back to the drawing board. And once you see something that works, you gain that little bit more experience so you can start to look for the other things. And uh, so I just found the whole medium because I had sort of come into this uh, industry pretty quickly and I'd taken a break from seeing IMAX movies for a long time. Uh, I wasn't quite familiar with it. And so, yeah, it's just a big surprise to see like what you need to do to make an interesting image or a clip. And it's, Mike, it's, it's, did you start off wanting to make this a giant screen film from the very beginning? Um, yes and no. I think uh, I, I had planned to make an IMAX movie and just by coincidence ran into Daniel and the Cosmic Boys in Kenya. And so I was working on a different wildlife series there. 
and I'd been pre prepping a pitch for uh, for volcanoes, but didn't really know where to take it. So um, I had shot a lot of material associated with my TV, and I thought, you know, maybe I could adapt that. And that was one of the first things I knew right away that's, okay, I have to kind of forget it. I think I used maybe five clips of my old stuff in, in the actual film, maybe just a couple of good eruptions that I just couldn't pass up on. Uh, but pretty much I was told right from the get-go, it's like, you know, this needs to be giant screen, so go back and do it. So it meant, meant a lot of travel over the next couple of years, but it was definitely worth it. One of the, the interesting things working with the BBC over the last 10 years is, A, they have some of the best wildlife photographers and cinematographers in the world, but all those guys have learned their skills over decades for TV. And so when we go out in the field to film something for the giant screen, I almost every day have to do a briefing about giant screen framing and composition and break out the sacred master. And everybody nods their head, yeah, 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 we got it, we got it, we got it. But when the lions are doing the Macarena, they fall back on that skill set that they've developed over such a long period of time. And I will just look at them, like, what are you doing? What did we talk about? Oh, right, yeah, 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 it's crazy. And so it's a constant struggle between the intellectual part and, and the instinctual part of, of these filmmakers that have been established. And uh, my good friend Mike Slee even has been guilty of it at times on Butterflies. I remember we were filming Butterflies and I just happened to walk and, and look at the monitor and said, Mike, what are you doing? This is, it's not working, it's too tight. And he's like, guess it's fine, don't worry, it's gonna be fine. I said, Mike, this is a shot that's not gonna make it in the film. He's like, you're like an IMAX Nazi. And he just stormed <laughs> off and I was like, what was that? But I mean, sometimes that's what it takes. There's no worse feeling than coming back from a shoot, whether it's in your backyard or over a volcano, and realizing that all that time and effort and risk, you know, on so many levels, isn't going to make the cut. And it's just tragic. So, I think one thing we adapted to, just in terms of our our technical space, was our our editing room changed when we started making giant screen films. We now have a a big TV monitor that we use, and, and, you know, instead of doing the side-by-side -side editing with uh, just regular Traditional size. Traditional Avid style. Yeah, yeah, Avid monitors. We have, a, we have a giant screen monitor, so when you- And we sit this close to it. <laughs> and, so, so, and, and that helps, and actually we're moving to a new studio at the end of the month, and we, uh, we act, it's a former television studio, and we have one wall now that is, we're gonna get the image as big as we can, so we, as we're editing, we can actually project onto that wall and get a sense of how it's working. <coughs> and we've done that too. That. When we were working with Bailey Silic on a project, um, because of his eyesight, there were a couple of things that he didn't want to sit close to the monitor, so we brought in a projector and just blasted an entire wall of the edits. So he's like, oh, okay, now I see. Okay, great. So sometimes you have to go to the extremes. Um, now having done it, what would you guys do differently on, on future projects? We'll start with Michael, because it's probably still feeling fresh. Uh, what would I do in different? Yeah, like what would you do differently on your, your next project? Would you get all the funding in place first? Would you script it and script it and script it until it was super tight? Like wh how would you, or maybe you wouldn't do anything differently? Yeah, I think um, one thing that's unique about all of us is we're very different filmmakers. Um, so I, I kind of feel you're one type and you need to be true to that one type. Um, some people would want to sit down and have that thing banged out, know 100% what the script is, fully funded, but that obvi obviously takes years to do. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking at a production time of four to five years, where in our survival in the industry, because when I came into television, it was kind of as it was diving. So you, it was incredibly hard to get in before when there was big money, but we kind of grabbed this curve with the lower budgets, the better technology, and so we adapted our style based around that. It was basically pure survival. I started off making half-hour episodes at $10,000 an episode, which was, at that time, unheard of. They had been in budgets around $100,000, $150,000 minimum for that time period. Um, so it taught me how to be resourceful, it taught me how to multitask. Uh, you know, you were forced to become a DP editor and all of this stuff because you couldn't afford it. So um, that's where I'm most comfortable when I work. It's, I think if I had a big crew, lots of money, um, I don't think it would be something that would be very pleasurable for me. So I like small, compact, it's what I'm good, what I'm comfortable with. Um, I see filmmaking as an adventure. 
So I want to have an adventure and find my film as I'm going through it. So I'd like to go in with a good rough idea, uh, but it may not be possible. Certainly with volcanoes, it's just very unpredictable. I would have liked to have had, like, say, Krakatoa, which was my inspirational volcano when I started. Um, it went through a, a period where it was inactive for seven years. Of course, we finished the film, and we have this catastrophic eruption that Kaboom. happened and killed 500 people a few months ago. Now the volcano is completely gone. It's underwater again. Uh, but Hawaii, which is something that I knew I would love to have, some sort of like a big fissure eruption or something on that grand of a scale, but it only happens every 40 years. And just by coincidence, it happened at the very tail end of our production. And it, the scientists are saying it was the biggest eruption in 200 years of that volcano. Yeah. So, Pretty crazy. Um, I think it knew it wanted to be on an IMAX movie. So <laughs> it did that. Ready for its close-up. How about you, Peter? What would you do differently? Maybe choose a different location? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's many things I would do differently. But, uh, you know, I think one of the, the biggest lessons uh, is to, to never take funding for granted. Um, because at any moment, uh, if it doesn't come through, it can really screw you. So. Um, uh, you know, I think I think it's good to have uh, contingency plans, you know, laid out well in advance, and then contingencies for those contingencies, um, and uh, and yeah, I think um, on the uh, the technological side, I think it's it's almost gotten to the point now where um, where the cameras don't matter as much um, if you have a really good post facility in place. Um, I don't know if any of you were able to tell the difference between the 18 cameras we used on, on the film, uh, but I think, you know, OnSite did a phenomenal job, you know, making it look seamless. Um, so, uh, so that's, I mean, that's good news for new filmmakers because I think you can pretty much shoot on anything now that's, uh, you know, at the top of the top of the heap and get great results as long as you do the post properly. So um, one of the things I would do differently is to make sure you uh, make sure you're properly uh, budgeted for post. Yeah, to <laughs> from be the sure. Outset. Yeah. I would say too that just from my experience, you know, as we move into this bold digital age, and it's very exciting for all kinds of reasons. It's terrifying for all kinds of reasons. but. Uh, it comes back to risk versus reward. So, you know, Peter is quite knowledgeable about all that camera tech at a very, very high level and was more willing to maybe take risk and shoot with 18 cameras where I would have maybe gone with a couple of cameras that I'd worked with for years and maybe introduced one new camera into that mix. I think probably of those 18, a few of them were, you guys are sort of early beta adopters even. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but again, you know, a big shout out to the post-production miracle workers who are able to take that stuff and make it not only look seamless, but make it look outstanding. You know, IMAX and everybody else. It's a, it is a chain. It is a process from start to finish. And it's easy, especially with younger, super uh, excited camera people who get fixated on camera and capture and sometimes forget about all the other work that has to happen downstream of that. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. What about you guys? What would you do differently? What will you do differently? Uh, I think one of the things I learned and that I really appreciate about this industry is um, who we're making the films for and the audience that we have, that 8 to 80 audience, um, you know, sitting in the American Museum of Natural History where we go probably every other weekend just to be in the audience and hear what people say, uh, that's been, first of all, so inspiring but also really informative because uh, I think the things that, one of the reasons why we want to do Wings so much and are so passionate about it is because we think it's really going to be a good film for uh, the museum programmers. And that that's going to be a film that the subject, I think the, the most important thing is you get a subject that's really going to work for people. And that's a huge choice because you're, you're dedicating two years, three years, 
four years maybe, of your life to bringing something, bringing a story and a subject and a, a you know whole field of science to, in our case, to to an audience. So, for me, the most one of the most important things that I would do differently, and we I think are making a good choice, is the the choice of the the subject of your film. I had uh, the real pleasure and honor to introduce the volcanoes a few weeks back at the California Science Center. And it's always thrilling and terrifying and all the things, but it was, I think, family day at the museum, so it was packed. And uh, I answered some questions afterwards, and then I walked out to the lobby, and a mom came out with her eight-year-old daughter and sort of nudged her forward, and, and she said, uh, one day I want to be a scientist. And you're just like, right, that's why we do this, right? And it's hard sometimes when you're in the field and you're just suffering. And you're like, I just want any other job, like bartender, hired, right? <laughs> but then you remember moments like that, and you're like, okay, that's what's going to get me through this. So, but yeah, there are definitely low moments. So, Michael, maybe what was a low moment for you? And it might not have been in around a volcano, right? Yeah, no, actually, when I met on volcanoes or out in a field, uh, be it in Africa or whatever, that's like my ultimate um, peace place. So, right. uh, like the stresses, the bureaucracy. None of that stuff really bothers us. Uh, my friend from Tanzania here, uh, they have a saying there called Hamnashida or Hakuna Matata, as you might know it. Uh, but it just means no worries. And so you kind of adopt that mentality after you've gone through this. You know, if you're going to do a car drive that's 100K, you know you're going to get stopped by the police at least six to eight times along that journey. Um, we deal with a lot of very extreme locations which they don't like people to go into so we have like just adversity at every stop where we go whether or not we're actually allowed to go up to these volcanoes um, to be caught in the middle of, of it uh, sorry I actually lost track but no but so you're pretty comfortable in those environments where, where were you least comfortable in the filmmaking process yeah what was the lowest moment for you and, the lowest moment, I think, probably would have been Seattle when we, so we had, the history of the film, we had showed a rough cut, uh, I can't remember the GSCA that it was, but the one before that. And it was quite a rough film, but it was edgy and it had like, you could see the passion in it. And so we got a great response off of it. And we took all the collective notes and got a lot of feedback. We started to evolve the story, but in the process of evolving the story, we lost some of the magic that was in, in the first cut. And so it's, you come out of the first one with a high and then you see the second one and you're watching the audience like you're talking about what you learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I often watch people and so you kind of know if your film's going well. And a few parts in the film I was like, oh, I wish I could have cut that out. Oh, this needs to be shorter. And you go through this desperate panic situation that it's like, I messed this up. I had something that was good, but you know, Karsten became very sanitized because we were worried about the danger level of it. And he's an edgy character, and it's a dangerous location, so he can't be that safe because he's not normal. And so it was trying to gain the confidence to make the character where he needs to be that satisfies all the different things. And so I came out of Seattle just feeling crushed, but determined. I think I landed at 8 o'clock at night. I stayed up the whole night. I recut the film by, I think, probably about midday the next morning. I think I cut 10 minutes out of the film that night. And then when I started to see the flow, um, you start to build your confidence back up. And then thankfully, when we went through the, uh, I guess I'm going to do my highest moment, is when you then show your what's going to be almost final film and you see the audience engaging you see them reacting you know they make they laugh where you want them to laugh i think i knew if it was going to be six seven minutes in if people like go wow when you see that first thing of them going over the lava like you know you've got them and uh there was a couple of like people saying like don't do that don't go there and you know these people are just glued to the edge of your seat and it's like okay now i can breathe and it's working yeah but six months between that period you don't breathe <laughs> only six months though because i mean yeah. it's been years on a couple of projects i worked yeah. on uh how about you peter what was kind of the the lowest moment and then tell us what the highest moment was um having to make a 20-minute version <laughs> <laughs> I guess 
Actually, you know, when we, when we tried for three years to get uh, helicopter aerial permits, and we actually got them uh, January of last year, and, uh, but then a week later they were pulled for whatever reason, and uh, that was pretty, pretty disappointing. And, um, um, we, you know, we never knew exactly why, but we had, uh, we got some ideas of, of why that was, and I think the main one was that Fast and the Furious had gone in, um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty hot and crazy on, on what they did and, and scared the authorities because uh, they thought we were going to fly the same way. Um, but eventually we were able to, uh, to shoot the aerials uh, with a drone that uh, the Cuban government specified and had a military escort the whole time. So, um, the, you know, ended up uh, being great footage and uh, so I think simultaneously, you know, uh, one of the lowest and one of the highest moments. What about you guys? What was the lowest moment? Uh, definitely the lowest moment for us was running out of money and having to basically put the production on ice, having to say to the people that we were working with, we're not sure when and how we're going to be able to finish this. I think we always knew that we were going to finish it, but it just wasn't always clear how we were going to do it and when it was going to happen. And what, then what, what happened to that Phantom 4K? Turned that into quick cash. <laughs> but luckily that was, well, that was actually a little bit later in the, in the whole game uh, because the, the lowest moment did turn into, I think, the highest moment, which was that moment of really knowing, like, we are going to finish this film and we're going to finish it on a schedule. And that was uh, the moment at this conference, I think, uh, probably three years ago or some, somewhere abouts, uh, when we, we uh, hooked up with SK Films and brought them on board, which gave us uh, the momentum and then, uh, through their great contacts, much needed uh, production funding that would actually get it finished. I mean, there were still key things that we had to bring in and there were some additional grants that helped close that gap, but that was really the big thing was partnering with a distributor uh, from a funding perspective and also from a knowledge perspective of how we were going to make our concept work for this very specific market. And so that was key, absolutely key, and a, a real high for both of us. So I would say that's a really good point to, to bring up, um, both in terms of financing, because we're always on the edge financially. I mean, it's very rare that these films are fully funded easily at the get-go, and it's just a, a walk in the park. Almost always, it's a, each project is unique, but it's a hodgepodge of financing sources, whether that's corporate sponsorship or government grants or some sort of tax credit situation. And it's a constant struggle. And then you add to that, like we have with SK Films, like, hey, let's do a multinational co-production. So you're balancing currencies and expenditure ratios and all this stuff. It gets crazy, crazy, crazy. But um, you have to have faith. You have to know that you will get there as long as you've got something of value, something to offer. So, you know, that's usually for me where it starts. When people come to me with projects, the first thing I do is, is this a film that, that is worth the time and effort and pain and suffering? And if I think it is, then usually I can find somebody who's willing to put some money into it and make it happen. Um, the other point that I was going to bring up that, that Andy touched on is that if you are a first time giant screen filmmaker, and some of you out there may be uh, thinking about it, don't try and do it by yourself. Talk to people, talk to me, talk to these people, talk to SK, talk to Greg McGillivray, talk to Phil Strether. You know, there are, are hundreds and hundreds of years of experience and, and good lessons and, and even better lessons about how not to do stuff. But we're very happy to help you because we want to see your film succeed. You know, the rising tide floats all boats. We're not super competitive and going to try and shut you down or steal your idea, to be honest. There's more good ideas and there's money to make them. So. You know, if you're thinking about embarking on this, please come find us. We'll help you and give you advice. Don't just try and do it on your own. You will pay a dear, dear price. Um, so we have a bit more time. Is there anything you guys want to talk about? Anything else you want to touch on uh, before we open it up for Q&A? Yeah, Go ahead, Michael. I guess, um, how many people are thinking of making an IMAX movie out there. Can you raise your hand? Yeah. 
So yeah. you're the competition. No, I don't know. I, I, I think the big question, like you, you have to be brave to make an IMAX movie, but you have to be brave to make any type of movie. Um, the big thing that I would say to anyone out there is recognize that this isn't television in the sense that it has a history. There's people in this room who built this industry and they built it with hard work, with developing technology, and you have to kind of understand where this industry came from. You can take it in a different direction, but you have to kind of do it incrementally in steps. So if you're not thinking about filling the screen, I would say that's a big error. If you're not thinking of spending really good money on 3D, that's an error. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's one thing to make a film, but to actually get it into the theater and get leases so it pays back the money is a huge, huge risk. Um, journey's worth it. Uh, to see your stuff up on the big screen like that's unbelievable. Like the comment that Miles just gave about the, the kid wanting to be a scientist. I've gotten a bunch of emails from people and one girl said that she, she now wants to become a volcanologist and I think was a year away from university and rethought what she was going to do. So we are inspiring that next generation. Um, there was a ter terrific uh, uh, tribute to Tony Myers from all the, the astronauts who said, you know, I went to a Tony Myers movie and I wanted to become an astronaut. So we have a huge responsibility, not only to our audiences, but to the people who built this industry. And so you need to respect that that is a big screen. We need to fill it and we need to fill it with really, really interesting stuff because the better each of these filmmakers do. Like, I'm not in competition with any of these guys. If they make a great film, they've inspired that people to come back and check out the next film. So we have it, uh, a, a responsibility to do the very best we can, and it's a pretty hard job. Mm. I'll just add that for all these challenges, there are amazing, unexpected joys. And um, uh, thinking of one of the, the things that was one of the easiest things that I felt like I had to do on Backyard Wilderness, it was getting the mouse to jump up into the dryer vent, <laughs> and, which I was so worried about being impossible. But then I discovered that once you learn the secret of mouse whispering, it's easy. And that I only actually, takes 10 minutes. I actually made that mouse jump into that dryer vent about six times just because I could. <laughs> and that was fun. All right, so let's open it up. If anybody has questions, uh, you can either walk up to the microphone that's here up front, uh, or you can just stand up and shout and get your morning voice on. That's fine. Please just let us know who you are, and then we'll. Hi, Robin Doty from uh, Museum of Science Boston. Um, I just want to say we're making movies for thinkers, and I think that's really important to stress, and I stress that to all the filmmakers out there. We want you in this mix. Um, these are the movies that are going to change opinions, they're going to change lives. So I think it's very important to keep in mind. Um, a couple quick comments. If you haven't seen North of Superior, see it, okay? It's a fantastic, one of the first films. It, it moved me like few other films have, and it told me to sort of really watch what's going on. Another quick questions or comments to Peter. Peter, I'm very curious to know, um, the, your movie had catch, captured a certain spontaneity that I really, really treasured in it. And I'm not sure if those were the accidental, oh my God, what are we going to shoot today kind of discoveries. But there's a level of spontaneity in that film. I've don't, I haven't seen a lot of in this industry. Um, you could clearly tell the planned shots from the shots that seem to happen by discovery. So I'm curious to know a little more about that process and what was the point at which you decided to have the, the wonderful characters in that film look directly at the camera? Well, the looking uh, in the camera th thing, I think, um, was inspired by, uh, by Ron Fricke's work in uh, Cleona Scotzi and Baraka. Um, I think when you break the fourth wall, it's it's very powerful, um, you know, to connect uh, on an emotional level. And I and you know I had this idea that 
could be an interesting way to, to end the film and, and allow people to sort of connect with the Cuban people. And uh, at one point we had, we had it scattered throughout the film, but I think it, it, it just felt, you know, it felt like it had more power at the end. Um, as, as far as the spontaneity goes, um, you know, we, uh, a lot of this just happened on the street and just capturing slices of life and, you know, while we were waiting for permits. And so it was in a lot of exploration of, of Cuba and just um, capturing stuff as it happens. And, and there's so much happening, uh, so much life and vibrancy in Cuba. Anywhere you point a camera, there's, there's something happening. But as far as, you know, capturing it with uh, with this technology, um, with this level of technology and, and crew as it's happening, that's a much, that was a much bigger challenge. It's one thing to do it with a DSLR, but um, with the whole crew. But I would just know. quickly jump in and say it's even another thing to try and do it with an IMAX film camera. Like you probably couldn't have done yeah, that if it, it had might been not anything. Have, but it's probably it, not right. been as as possible. Um, but you know, early on, uh, we brought on a, a cinematographer uh, named Christopher Doyle who some of you might know, uh, shot films like Chunking Express and The Mood for Love, um, Hero. And, you know, I had been inspired by his work for a long time, and, and I, f I feel like he was able to, you know, sort of create spontaneous, um, candid moments um, and capture them in a, in a very kind of artful um, and often dramatic way. Uh, so having you know, studied his work um, and studied his method and then bringing him in for, uh, a as a collaborator, you know, I think we sort of set the, set the style and tone early on that um, you know, we, wanted to, we wanted to capture uh, this uh, the, you know, the sort of um, improvisational uh, spirit uh, of Cuba. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, how, how did I come up with the idea for Cuba? Um, actually, it was Violet's idea. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, uh, we were looking for places to, uh, to, to, to go to, and um, we, you know, as musicians, we were both uh, deeply inspired by films like One of Us is Social Club, and uh, I had always wanted to visit Cuba. Um, and, and check it out. So, uh, you know, when we were hearing that uh, things might open up under Obama, we decided to, in late 2014, decided to go. And, um, and then, you know, the announcement happened. And uh, so, as, you know, w when we were there, um, just traveling around, the, the idea sort of uh, crystallized. We had some idea going in that we wanted to, to you know, do something, um, and, and I brought a DSLR, but um, you know, I don't think it was, we didn't like set out to initially to, to do a giant screen film. Um, maybe we would do a non-narrative film of just cool stuff. Yeah. And, and cool street bands. <laughs> like, there's a place I want to go for a long time, I know I'm going to experience it more if I do a project there. I invent myself and look around. But Deciding on characters and story was a real challenge because you only get 40 minutes. It's an entire country. Tons of stuff going on. So stilling that was very difficult. And then doing 20 minutes version. And then <laughs> 20-minute version. Yeah, you know, and, and on that first trip, um, you know, I think I, uh, about a week in, I started shooting uh, a sizzle reel. Um, that some of you might remember from like uh, GSCA conference in 2015, um, and uh, just you know, sell it to, to sell the project. And um, 
one of those shots and ended up being the the final shot in the film, the ti- kind of the title Cuba shot, um, and that was before all the cranes came into Havana because yeah. now you know you can't get that shot anymore without some expensive removal. Please forgive me. When, when you're beginning to do a giant screen film like this, I've heard corporate sponsorship, grants, um, angel investors, and things like that. For a first timer like this, where would you encourage me to begin to look for funding? I know that not everybody can be funded and that it comes from a lot of different directions, but if, if you were to offer advice to someone like me who asks stupid questions, where would you begin to look for funding to, to create a film like that? More than likely, you'll see a big line of filmmakers all standing, waiting to talk to the financiers. You just get in that line and polish your, your pitch. But I think every project is different. And I don't think that there's a single set answer, but it starts with the concept and the creative. And as I said before, if, if you really believe and, and you have other people that believe that that concept is powerful, then you can start having conversations that will lead to financing. But um, there are people, and typically, financiers are going to look for some sort of distribution, at least a, a letter of intent or something like that, so that they know that their money has a reasonable chance of finding a way back. Uh, and so oftentimes talking to distributors who will also help you kind of frame up your creative idea uh, in a way that's attractive to financiers is good. But talk to filmmakers too. Like we all have horror stories and success stories and, and we will certainly share with you everything but the names and phone numbers of the people that give out money. Um, I, I also think you have to, your film's about space. I focus on uh, foundations, groups, individuals who care about space education. Because this is really, I think, a, a format where we are inspiring and educating and entertaining. And all those things reach people in their hearts and they make change. And I think that you, ha- I mean, we focused on people that we know that care about getting kids off their screens and out into the environment. And they're connecting with uh, plants and animals around us so that we can be more sensitive. And that, that worked for us in terms of, of fundraising uh, to a certain point. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to have that energy. And that, that's actually, I think, one of the hardest things about making these films is that fundraising is, a, is a, an art form and a profession. And when you're a filmmaker and you're having to put on that hat, I mean, actually, I, in my office, I, have, I had three different hats. I literally, I had the fire chief hat. You know, I had uh, 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 a ringmaster hat. And I had my sort of long sun hat. <laughs> and I would think about the different roles that I had to play in this three-year production. So, you, and it's 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 it's, all, it's a total different form of communication too. You write to people differently when you're asking for money for your project. But you, you, if you have that passion and you really want to make this happen and you really want to reach that audience, you can you can ask for. $100,000 or $500,000 or if you know somebody who's out there who's got a million dollars to give to space education, ask them. Don't be afraid yeah, to ask at all. It never hurts to ask. And as Susan says, you better be passionate because you may only get one chance at it, but it comes back around to the concept. Like, you can be super passionate about STEAM, but you're going to have a tough time 
finding money to make a movie about mm -hmm. steam. So, uh -huh. you know, just make sure that what you're starting with is going to be something that's attractive. Michael has something to add. Yeah, I figured I, w I would add. It may not apply to your story, but it depends on your subject matter. If you don't have lots of money, maybe pick a subject matter that works. Um, one way to cut your budget in our case is we slept on a lot of ground. And uh, <laughs> so I think we probably did, I would say, 300 days of shooting on volcanoes. And I think I probably slept in a tent or a mattress or Jan and I, like quite often we had actually I spent seven days in Japan, and we slept on the side of a road waiting for a volcano to erupt. We used two shots in the film from that. But there are so. other ways, too. I mean, like Michael's analogy of sleeping on the ground, like if you've got a lot of CGI, which you probably do, then start looking outside of your backyard uh, at places like Australia, where you can get a 60% tax credit on CGI work and things like that. So finding ways to bring your cost down and make more out of every dollar will, will help. So we've got time for about two more questions. Go ahead. Oh, uh, the, the, new, the new person to the industry. Yes, Diane Carlson, Giant Screen Cinema Consulting. First of all, thanks to all the panelists. I come from an exhibitor background, and I just love learning about the craft and art of what you guys do. So thanks for all the behind the scenes. Um, my question deals with dealing with the sound environment, the audio. Um, at least for me, as someone sitting in the audience, an audience as a viewer, the the sound uh, environment means a lot to me, uh, especially in the giant screen world. So I don't know if you have some comments about that uh, for um, new uh, filmmakers. Thank you. <laughs> Looks like we're only going to get one question. Uh, I, I think, uh, where is Brian? He's <laughs> here somewhere. Brian's he sleeping. Anybody. Brian's sleeping. He's, he's, he's sleeping. Good for him. But he's, I, but I he's do doing a presentation this uh, afternoon. Getting involved with your post people up front makes a big difference. And in our case, it was uh, getting involved with Brian and letting him know what we had, getting his encouragement about what we needed to do, and then having a plan from there to kind of take it forward so that we knew that our end result was going to be uh, what we wanted. I think if we had just sort of stumbled along, uh, just leaving it to our own knowledge base to the end, we wouldn't have been uh, in nearly as good a situation as, you know, locking down the, the key people that were going to help us get to the finish line. I actually think, too, one of the most pleasurable parts of the film for us of Backyard Wilderness was working with our composer. The music in these films, it just brings them to life. And, uh, you know, at Peter's film and Michael's film all have this this music that just stirs you and that's that's a really important component I think to uh, the experience of being in the in the cinema is feeling feeling that that depth of emotion that uh, music can bring and the drama I would just jump in and say you know we often sort of quickly jump to the idea or the conclusion that this is a visual format. But to be honest, it's visual and audio. They're, they're equally important. And too often, and we've been guilty of this, uh, we show up late in the game and start thinking about the audio. And as, as uh, Andy was saying, you really need to start at the very beginning. And um, oftentimes, that's not just because field recordings are pretty uninspired. You know, if you could hear the field recordings from Michael's film, it'd be a lot of people screaming as they ran away. <laughs> so we, we oftentimes have to sort of choreograph what that scene is going to sound like and where the, the not only the visual highs and lows are, but also the audio highs and lows, the bass track and all that stuff. And then with Peter's film, the music is such a key part of the soul of that film. That requires a lot of thought. And Peter spent, in Violet as well, spent years just going through and listening to Cuban songs and Cuban music and really pushing the, the boundaries of what that's done. So uh, I think, Diane, your point is just the sound is critical, and we would agree with that, absolutely. OK, we have time for one more quick question, and then Mark Katz is going to brush us off the stage. Another first timer. Go yeah. ahead, Nate Cohen. <laughs> uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm Nate Cohen. I had the great privilege of being the post supervisor for both Backyard Windows and Volcanoes, which I have to say was a complete joy for me. So. Thank you very much. Not complete yeah. joy. But oh, it was. <laughs> joy, joyful, right, yeah. Um, so achieving aerials for aerial photography for the giant screen is a particularly difficult task. Um, it's a very unforgiving screen. And there's a lot of cameras and systems out there, drone photography, for example, that you know just doesn't cut it. 
Um, so I'm curious to hear from you guys about your, your experiences filming aerials and particularly Peter, um, you know, having to go from your helicopter aerials, having to go drone. What was that experience like for you? Did you test different systems? How did it, how, what was the post process like? All that stuff. Yeah, I mean, we, we tested various systems and, you know, we had sort of a, a wish list of, uh, of what we would use in a helicopter and I think would have allowed us to cover a lot more ground and, and shoot in places that are more inaccessible. Um, but, um, you know, um, I, I think it's a good idea to, it, if you have a production timeline to just save the aerials for last if you're shooting digitally because, you know, then you'll, ha you'll be able to maximize the technology and, and get the most out of it. Um, uh, because, you know, as, as, good as, uh, as good as the digital sensors are getting, I think we're still um, pushing the limit uh, on, on the aerial side, uh, especially when you, uh, when you uh, output to film and, and see it on a dome. So, um, you know, the post process is, is, is obviously a really important part of making these digital images look as good as they can be um, and, and, you know, uh, compensate for the uh, resolution shortcomings that they still have, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 1570. So just to wrap things up here, I think, uh, you know, welcome to all of you first timers and thanks to all of you veterans for coming and getting up early this morning. Um, it's clear from the success of these filmmakers and their films that new filmmakers, new visions, new perspectives are, are, can be successful in this format and I would argue are essential to the lifeblood and, and future success of the format. So uh, if you've got crazy ideas, if you want to try something different, if people tell you don't do it, it's never been done before, that should spur you on to have <laughs> yeah. conversations with more people who've done it before, before you launch into that effort. But we welcome you and we encourage you to try new things and help us make better films. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>